Hello, this is Mark Lindy. You're watching Brockton Community Access, uh, your local channels for government, education, and public coverage here in the City of Champions. Tonight, we are focusing on the 2017 Councilor at Large race. Uh, the Councilors at Large run citywide. There are four Councilors elected, and four out of the eight people that are here on set tonight will be uh, your new con new candidate, your, I'm sorry, your, can your counselors at large, excuse me. Um, I have on my panel here tonight, I have um, Kevin Tocci from WATD Radio. I have uh, Councilor Shana Barnes, who is counting down her days for um, uh, going into the star of stage, screen, and television. And I have Steve Foote, who is uh, the former host of Democratically Speaking, who now happens to be an unenrolled voter. Um, in the studio, I have... Um, all eight candidates for Councilor at Large. Thank you, gentlemen, for all being here. Um, I guess we're going to go maybe from left to right on this. We have Moses Rodriguez, who's a current Councilor at Large. We have Jacob Taggart, candidate for Councilor at Large. Uh, City Council President Robert Sullivan. Uh, Scott Hall. Gene Bradley Duranancourt. I think I got it right. Bill Hogan. Gary Keith uh, from the Planning Board. And current Councilor at Large and former Mayor Winthrop Farwell. Thank you all for being here and taking the time out. This is a very important election for, for Brockton. So uh, we're going to start uh, right away with opening statements. And we did a scientific drawing. I think it probably was out of Jay Miller's hat. Um, so the first person up uh, to speak is uh, William Hogan. And it'll be for one minute. That's more than enough. <laughs> Thank you for having me here today, Mark, and uh, the Brockton Community Access um, Television. Um, I'm very happy to be here to try to uh, represent um, Brockton as a councilor at large, maybe get a seat on one of the four uh, spots that are open. Um, I'm just going to, it's a very brief, uh, uh, I would say, resume of my life here. I've been a lifetime, lifetime um, resident of Brockton, graduate of Brockton High School in 1975. Um, I'm right at the moment, I'm a uh, member of the Brockton Lions Club, the Brockton Library Foundation, the Brockton High School alumni, and I own the uh, Downtown Brockton Museum. I'm very much into the rich history of Brockton, Massachusetts. Um, it's, it's, a, it's uncanny of the, uh, how great Brockton really is over the years uh, and still is. And uh, I'm looking forward to um, serving Brockton forever, whether I, whether I win, am I lucky enough to win an election, uh, be, maybe have a seat for the city council. That's fine, but I really do enjoy working for Brockton. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next up is uh, Councilor at Large Moses Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you, uh, BCA and the panelists, for being here tonight. Um, to the voters of Brockton, I had the pleasure of being elected um, two cycles ago. Um, uh, we're in the middle of our second election cycle, and it's been a pleasure serving you as a, as a city councilor here in the city. We have still a lot of work to be done. And that's why I'm seeking re-election again in, on November 7th of this year. Uh, Brockton has some serious issues, and we need some serious people to roll up their sleeves and take care of those issues that the city has. And the only way we can do that is to send uh, candidates into the city council who aren't afraid of rolling up their sleeves and push the envelope. Uh, question things that needed to be questioned and step up when it needs to be stepped up. So for that, I ask for your vote on November 7th. I believe I'm number two on the, uh, on the ballot and I count on you and your vote. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Next would be Jacob Tatter. Hello, my name is Jacob L. Taggart Jr. I'm number eight on the ballot, running for one of the four seats for Council at Large here in the city that I was born and raised in for 41 years. Um, I'm a father, I am a community activist and a volunteer for over 23 years um, in the city that, that we call home. Um, I do wanna make sure, as, as everyone should, to thank BCA, of course, WATD, Kevin Tachi. Definitely wanna thank Councilor Barnes for um, doing what I feel a counselor should do um, and that's, you know, keep the administration accountable um, and be the checks and balances for the city. So I do want to say I appreciate your, your four years of service. Um, and then, of course, Mr. Foote for being here as well. Um, on November 7th, what, what I want the, the voters to vote for is to maintain the accountability and the integrity of the city of Brockton. And by doing that, 
you have to have counselors that um, will ask the tough questions and be an advocate for the residents. And I do feel that I am one of your four choices. Um, on November 7th, I am number eight on the ballot. My name is Jacob Altaga Jr. Thank you. Okay, next, Gary Key. Good evening. I'd like to thank my friends in the PCA um, and our three panelists for giving us this opportunity to come before you tonight. Um, but more importantly, I'd like to thank you, the listening viewers, for giving us the opportunity to come into your living rooms tonight. Tonight, you're going to hear me answer a lot of questions and talk about my visions and my experiences. Uh, so at the end of this 90-minute forum, I will be able to ask you, our citizens of Brockton, um, for one of your four votes to be your next city council at large. I do have the experience by uh, currently sitting on the Planning Board of Appeals, uh, the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I'm a husband of 31 years, a father to seven, and a grandfather to four. 27-year residence here in the city of Brockton. And again, I bring the experience, the passion, and the knowledge to where I want to be your, my, your voice in city council chambers this year to represent you. I thank you very much. My name is Gary Keefe Sr. My name is the seventh one on the ballot this, in this year, and I'm asking you for one of your four votes. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, next is Scott Hall. Hi, I'm Scott Hall, um, a lifelong Brocktonian from the Lithuanian Village. I've got about 18 years professional <coughs> computer programming experience, primarily with Microsoft technologies, more specifically databases. I've been the lead architect on many complicated software projects, and I, I feel, you know, Brockton has a lot of uh, things to repair in the city, and I think uh, more efficient software systems can save millions and put us towards the path of, uh, you know, fixing things and integrating different departments and not, you know, giving people pink slips. Um, it doesn't have to be Microsoft technologies either. I just want to say that. Um, but look into that if, uh, regardless of who wins, just please look into more efficient software. I think that's a good start towards alleviating the issues we have in Brockton. Take care. Thank you. Uh, next would be Gene Bradley Deronico. Good evening. Uh, it's so great to be here. Thank you um, to Torchi, Shana, and of course Steve, and of course uh, Mike Lindy, and of course thank you to you for opening your TV to see us this evening debating the issue of Brockton. My name is Gene Bradley, the winning court, or the longest name on the ballot. Why not number four on the ballot? I'm here tonight to talk about the future of Brockton. Fortunately, I was able to come in this country in 2010 after one of the most devastating earthquakes in Haiti. When I came here, I could not speak the language. Uh, I was able to learn it at the Brockton Public Library, went to Massasoit, went to Suffolk University uh, because of the people of Brockton. You opened the door for me six years and nine months ago, and I hope you will open the door for me in these selections. I'm here tonight to talk to you about the education of our children, the ability to engage our young people, the homelessness situations, and so much more. It is an honor for me not just to be in the city, but to know you and being able to work with you. I hope I can count on your vote on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Next would be Council President Robert Sullivan. I do want to thank BCA. I want to thank the three panelists and, and Mr. Lindy as well. Uh, but more importantly, I want to thank you, the Brockton residents, the constituents, and the voters who have supported me over the last 12 years. I've been a councilor at large proudly serving the entire seven wards, 28 precincts, over 12 years. Uh, and I've also been elected by my peers um, to be the council president on three occasions. I currently serve in that capacity. I'm born and raised in the city of Brockton, raising uh, three young kids here. My wife's born and raised in Brockton. This election is about uh, the present, but more importantly, the future of the city of Brockton. I believe the election is about someone that has proven experience and dedication and diligence to the job. I want to work with you, but more importantly, I want to continue to work for you. Uh, people have said to me, why do you want to keep doing it? Because I believe I have more to, uh, to help uh, those that, that I serve, uh, meaning uh, I want to continue to just be diligent at all times and to be what a counselor at large should be. So again, you have four votes. I'm asking for one of your four votes. I'm number three on the ballot, but I'm always first for Brockton. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And last but certainly not least, uh, former mayor and current counselor at large, uh, Wynne Farwell. 
Uh, thank you, Mark, and I too want to thank BCA for sponsoring this forum. There's no way I can thank the voters, however, who gave me the honor of serving as a counselor at large for the last two years. I now have been blessed to hold every elective office in the city. I served for 10 years on the school committee, four years as mayor, and now almost two years as counselor at large. And what I try to do as a counselor is to bring accountability and oversight to city government. And I always ask myself one question, wherever the issue originates, whether it's from a colleague or from the mayor's office, I ask, is it good for Brockton? Will it enhance the quality of life for our residents? If it's good for Brockton, I'll sign on to it. I'll support it. I'm thoroughly independent. I continue to be that way, and I always will be. And so I ask for your vote on November 7th, and I'd like the honor of serving you again for another two years. Thank you very much. Thank you, all candidates. Uh, we will start right up with the questions, and I'm going to start with uh, Kevin Tachi first. And the order I'm going to go in, um, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that you know. Okay. Right. So the question was brought up by one of the candidates, education. It's one of those things. It's, we've seen over the past couple of years the school department's budget uh, deficit has grown over the past couple of years uh, with the blame being placed on a decrease of state funding and the placement of a charter school in the city. Uh, what's your take on the situation? Uh, is the deck being stacked against the city schools? Or are the school officials not being conscientious when it comes to crafting their annual budgets? And what needs to be done moving forward? I'm going to start with uh, Councilor Sullivan. That's a, that's a great question. And being a product of Brockton High School, class of 88, um, you know, I remember the Webby case. I remember the Hancock case and the McDuffie case. Uh, Brockton, quite honestly, does get shafted relative to funding from the state on our education. We have, uh, if not the best in the nation, definitely the best public school in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, this, this most recent uh, budget cycle, we, uh, we meaning the city council, uh, put $100,000 away relative to fighting, uh, again, the uh, deficit that we're getting from the state. We're going to work with other uh, cities in the Commonwealth uh, that are not getting the fair funding, and I believe uh, will prevail like we have three times. So I concur with that question, and I think that you know we have the students, we have the staff, and we need to make sure uh, that it's properly funded here in the city of Brockton, the city champions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next would be uh, Council Rodriguez. <clears throat> Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I too am a product of the Brockton Public School System. I. Um, I came to uh, Brockton back in the, uh, in the 70s and um, straight to Brockton High School. I uh, spoke absolutely no English. And I have that high school to thank for. Uh, I have the school system to thank for to help me get into the American uh, way of thinking. Uh, from that, I joined the military, served six years in the Navy, and I thank every day the Brockton public school system. But when you sit down and think about it, uh, as Council Sullivan said, the state hasn't been fair with the city of Brockton. Uh, we keep uh, on hearing how we've got the fourth largest school system in Massachusetts. Are we getting the funding at the fourth largest level? We also uh, have the best school system. Where is the gratification for having the best school system? So I honestly believe that we must do, and it's not just looking for funding, but we also have to be smart enough to make sure that the budget that are submitted are real uh, and decent budgets for our city as well. Okay, next would be uh, Councilor Fowler. Mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to keep it on time. Well, he's got to do it I know, I'm giving him the cues. Basically, there's a fatal flaw in the formula that the state uses to reimburse Brockton for school aid. Uh, we receive $14,700 per student as of the October 1st enrollment. However, that doesn't recognize the fact that Brockton has a very large school system, approximately 18,000 children. We are spread out over multiple school buildings, and many times we have children move into the city who require English language services. They're learning below grade level, and so the staff and the services have to be geared towards those children. And until the state recognizes that, we're going to be at a deficit, and all of us from the mayor on down have to work to address that. Thank you. Uh, next would be Gene. Uh, thank you so much, Tochi. I think that's an excellent question, and I'm so glad you mentioned it. Like I said, uh, six years ago, I came in this country not knowing how to speak a word of English. Unfortunately, uh, I was able to go to the Brockton Public Library where I started learning English, and I'm so glad um, the gentleman who just mentioned that ESL, I think this is something pretty powerful for the city. 
Um, when it's come down to the way the state allocate money to our city, especially um, Chapter 70, I think the state is doing a lot of injustice. Um, here's what I can tell you. Um, you know, as, a, as one of your next council at large, I will advocate. You know why? Because I know those people. I think by being able to talk to them and tell them this story, they will be able to understand that we in Brockton need more money for our students. It's important because if they don't know where you're coming from, they will never know where you, where you want to take them. The thing is that you got to be able to have the people who have the ability and the story to not only talk to them, but being able to explain why we think it's important. So I will do my best to advocate the state to make sure that we have the money that we deserve for all our students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next would be Scott. So regarding the funding um, for our public schools and, and well, any school for that matter, uh, it doesn't seem like any time in the near future you know, we're gonna, it just looks like we're gonna continually be deprived of the proper funding. So I implore every parent out there to maybe find other ways to uh, alleviate the uh, budget deficit by um, maybe fundraising, uh, being more engaged with uh, school activities. Um, I'd say things like in Minnesota, when there's snow days, they're now actually doing online schooling. Um, maybe consider this, I, I feel. A lot of students are learning things online, more so than in the classrooms, and uh, we, we should look into that more. And if uh, the, a great teacher should never be uh, replaced or you know stopped from teaching. Great teachers are very important. Keep Good. teachers. That's the bell. Okay, Bill Hogan, next. Well, I, uh, here we go. Mr. Fowler must have been here earlier. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the Brockton High School, I'm a graduate of Brockton High, like I said earlier, in 1975. I was one of the worst students ever came out of Brockton High School that uh, actually graduated. Um, this is, I'll be, just be honest with you, right, this isn't one of my strengths. But what I, have, what I do know is Brockton history. And we lost control of the local control of the, the schools a long, long, long time ago. And until, the, until us, the city council, the city itself, the mayor's office, understands that the state is, is the ones that pulled the, pulled the trigger on this a long, long time ago, maybe even the national, um, you know, the United States, and um, until we get the local control back of our school department, we're gonna be here again next spring laying off teachers and then rehiring some back in the fall. And do I have the magic wand and say, go away? I wish I had a billion dollars, I'd give it to us and we'd get it out of there, take care. But we have great teachers, we have a great school. Um, the students, they try like crazy. They're, they're, our music, our sports, there's nothing to, the, um, it's a great thing. Everybody should be proud of it. Thank you. Okay, next, Gary Keith. That's a very good question. I thank you for asking that. Um, all, of my, all of our seven children have gone through the Brockton Public School Systems. Our youngest one right now was actually in her last year. She should graduate this year here. We have a great school system here in Brockton, and we know the formula has changed and is stacked against us, but so does the state. The state knows when they change the formula how it was going to affect us. So at this point here, in my opinion, the state doesn't really care what's happening to us here. So at that point there, we as Brontonians need to get together, and we need to do whatever we need to do, whether we're marching on uh, the state house. Uh, calling our, um, our state delegations, whatever we need to do, we need to take strong, immediate action to try to get it fixed because what's happening right now, we can, um, with the teachers being laid off and everything else like that, that is unacceptable, okay? Um, we have one of the best school systems in the state, and I think we need to do whatever we need to do to correct it. Thank you. And last but not least this time is Jacob Tanner. So every election, um, we all know here, uh, the panelists know, it, there's always a, a captivating issue. Um, education should always be important, but in my opinion, this year is the most, um, we're in the, the most dire situation um, with the, the budget cuts. Um, and I, you know, some of us get up here, we, we all went to Brockton Public Schools, you know, I, I coach, um, I, so I deal with four to 500 youth that go to Brockton Public Schools yearly. Um, but I'm not sure if anyone's gotten up here and said that 
we depend too much on the state. The formula is messed up. As city councilors, we need to advocate to the state. But as a city, we need to become more independent. We need to look at some creative ways to actually you know, bring revenue in so we're not so dependent on the state. Because honestly, it's not going to get fixed this year. I, doubt, I don't think it's going to get fixed next year. We're going to be dealing with this. But we have to become more independent um, from the state as far as the funding goes. But education, number one priority, um, as it always should be. But definitely, as far as my candidacy, is definitely my number one issue. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we will go to the next question. That would be Shana Barnes. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, candidates and councilors, for coming this evening. Um, my question actually has to, it, I'm shifting gears a little bit. So. You all spoke in your, your opening statements about your qualifications um, to some level, why you feel that the voters should entrust their vote uh, to you, one of their four votes to you. So this question, I guess, has to be asked different for the candidates and for the counselors. So um, let's say that the, the voters do give you the vote and you do get a chance to either be reelected or to serve new uh, as a new counselor. Current counselors, what is your major accomplishment that you have uh, achieved so far, one or two very short uh, major accomplish accomplishments and candidates? If you are uh, lucky enough to be elected, what will be your number one priority uh, on the council? Okay, we're going to start with Jacob Tatter. Can you actually repeat how you... What would be that? your number one priority if you are um, voted on to the Accountability. City Council? Um, again, I did you know, just speak about education, so that should be the city's number one priority. Um, but accountability. I, I think sometimes um, voters don't or may not be educated and understand that what you, know, you guys do on the council. It's, you don't run the day-to-day -day of the city. That's the mayor. You guys approve the budget. You advocate for residents, um, write legislation. Um, and you hold the administration accountable. And I, I am very confident that it, you know, when I'm elected and I get to sit on the council with these gentlemen, um, we hold, hold the city accountable. And we make sure that the job that, that we're paying people to do gets done um, and you know, be the checks and balances. So accountability. Thank okay. you. Okay. Next would be Gary Keith. Thank you for that question, Councilor. Um, one of the first things that I would try, uh, do, and I would constantly uh, and consistently do it, is uh, transparency. Because I believe that um, the more transparent we are, the more we let the public know of what's going on in City Hall, the more that they will be involved and come more to the, uh, I think we'll have more people coming out to the City Council meetings um, and getting more involved if they know exactly what's going on. A lot of times people don't know when the meetings are. Um, some don't know who their counselors are or anything else like that. So I think that transparency um, is, is very key on that. So that's one of the first things that I would start doing is bringing people up to know what's going on in our council chambers. Thank you. Uh, Bill Hogan. Well, my, uh, my number one priority is to return the focus to downtown Brockton. Um, we've lost our uh, sense of a community because of the uh, positive venues that have been mu moved out of uh, Brockton over the last maybe 50 years, believe it or not. Um, we have some beautiful, beautiful uh, venues here in Brockton, uh, the Brockton Historical Society, the Firefighters Museum, um, Massasoit Com Community College, the Fuller Craft Art Museum, all on the outskirts of town. Um, we continue the practice here today um, of moving venues out of downtown. And the no, no town or city can, can fully e experience its full potential until downtown is given the respect and the attention that it deserves. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave that at that. There's a lot I could talk all night about it, and then you'd be very bored, but that's my answer to that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, next, Gene. That's an excellent question, and thank you so much for, for asking it. Um, how do I put this? I think, you know, Brooklyn is a wonderful place, and I love the city, and I will not move for anybody. But based on my observation, I think we do have a communication problem. And it seems like when it's come down to local government, there's always fight. And what I mean by fight is that it's very complex. I think one of my ability to actually bring something new on this platform is because I have the ability to work with different group of people. Not just that, and I speak at least five languages. And I think by being able to speak and being able to bring people together for the benefits of Brockton, open in line of communications, we will be able to move on. Because just because you don't like me doesn't mean we cannot work together. And just because you know your ideology doesn't match doesn't mean we cannot work. And I think now is the moment for us to see Brockton as one, 
not just as this Brockton and that Brockton. That's why my slogan is believe in Brockton. So if we believe in Brockton, we should be able to, comp to, to open that line of communication and hopefully to move the city forward. Thank you. Uh, when would be next? And just to reiterate, so, Councillor, if you could just maybe tell us about one of your um, greatest accomplishments while serving on the council for these two years. Well, I authored several uh, ordinances, as you know, Councillor Barnes. I think the most important one I co-sponsored with uh, Councillor Monaghan to modernize the hiring practices for the city. Uh, we now have an ordinance that mandates how positions should be advertised and that the best possible person should be hired. And in addition, records relating to the candidates need to be retained. Um, there were several other ordinances which created uh, minimal qualifications for the personnel director and for members of the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board. In terms of priority, my number one priority is there are too many shootings in the city. Even though someone isn't hit, even though someone isn't killed, we need to reorganize the police department, spend less money on overtime, and hire more officers. We are. We have a heavy dependency on hiring officers for overtime, and a tired police officer is an officer who could get put into a position where they have to make a critical decision, and frankly, they've worked too many hours. So public safety, number one priority. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Bob Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much for that question, Councillor. Um, you know, I have a political science degree from Boston College, an MBA from BC as well, and, and a law degree. I'm currently the only lawyer on the City Council, and I believe the only lawyer up here. Uh, I only mention that because I've been able to draft legislation and laws that have benefited the residents of the City of Brockton. I drafted an ordinance that helped senior citizens and veterans get uh, price reductions on the real estate by volunteering their time. I did Chapter 40 hour, which is smart growth zoning downtown. Uh, that has brought $30 million of, of real estate investment with Trinity Financial. But more importantly, I think the biggest thing I've done over the 12 years is I've, I've really been cost containment measures and thinking outside the box. When I uh, bang the drum to say purchase the streetlights in the City of Brockton, and my colleagues on the City Council agreed. We paid 42000 and it's reoccurring savings. We saved $550,000 year one, $650,000 year two. It's real money. It's that money we can use for teachers. We can use it for infrastructure. We can use it for police and fire. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, Shana, I want to have a safe community and a clean community. I'm going to continue if I'm elected to work for the best interest of the residents of the City of Brockton. Thank you. Thank you. And we're up to our third question, and that would be... Um, I missed two people. I'm sorry. What are you doing? Okay, I gotta, I'm sorry, Moses would be next. And Scott. Thank you. That's why I have a floor director. Scott. Well, uh, thank you for almost forgetting me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, uh, as, a, as a city council, and as, a, as it's been said here, um, we worked on many ordinances, some that have had some success, some others that have not been as successful. But our job is to basically put on the ordinances that we feel are useful to the, the residents here in the city of Brockton. My main objective uh, for the next coming uh, uh, two years, if I so happen to be lucky enough to get reelected, is to seriously look at the way uh, department heads are held accountable in this community. We have some department heads who don't have to go through the same processes as others do. And that's something that I'm working with my colleagues and also the, uh, the council to uh, our uh, legislative council to help us fix the way some of these individuals are, are uh, hired to, to the positions that they're hired. And that will actually work, especially when the police department, so we can have a better police uh, organization in place so to help us deal with the issue of uh, public safety in the city. Thank you. And Scott. I'm a computer geek, so my answer is a little biased, but we, I feel very strongly that we need to look into efficient software systems, more efficient software systems that integrate the departments. Uh, I, I've seen firsthand how this can save millions upon millions and lead to more millions in revenue. Um, the the city website, for example, it, it's a lot better than it was five years ago. However, I still have trouble finding a lot of things on the website. I would probably start there because that should be the portal where the whole community, whole community congregates to uh, figure out what's going on in the city. That should be the first and foremost uh, point for information. Take Thank care. You. 
Thank you. Now I'm ready to go to the next question. Steve Foote. I'm going to ask you the question that I've asked all the other candidates for the other offices that have been in before us. And uh, this is a question that uh, people on the street are always asking me to ask the candidates, so I'm going to ask you this. Now that recreational marijuana is legal, do you use marijuana or any other drugs, and would you be willing to take a drug test if you were asked? First, can't, first would be Robert Sullivan. Steve, when I ran for state rep, this question was asked because it's more of a state uh, type of question. But I, I, I'll answer your question. I've never smoked pot in my life. I'm not a drug addict. I do d drink uh, socially, uh, beer and wine at times. Um, I would, I would by all <laughs> means agree to a drug test. But the question should be asked of what an elected official locally does. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, we try to advocate to protect those that are dealing with opiate addiction and those that are dealing with drugs. So, you know, to ratify money for Narcan and the like. So I can answer your question, uh, and you can do your due diligence on me. I never have and never will. Uh, I'm a husband and father, concerned citizen. Uh, but I, I do appreciate you uh, asking the question. Thank you. Okay, next would be uh, Wynn Farwell. Well, I never smoked marijuana because I was afraid it would stunt my growth. <laughs> but uh, seriously, I became a summer police officer at age 19. And at that time, interestingly enough, and everyone here is younger than I am, possession of marijuana was a felony. It later became a misdemeanor, and then it became decriminalized. So consequently, having gone through the police academy at that age and having a police job, which helped me finance my way through college, uh, it was just nothing I got involved with. As to drug testing, anybody wants to drug test me any time of the day or, or, or any day in the week, that's fine with me because it, it's just nothing that was a part of my life. So I, I really can't identify with people who, uh, who are excited about having recreational marijuana. Thank you. Um, Moses. Um, <coughs> I too am gonna go the same route that um, Councillor Sullivan uh, went, and to be honest with you, as elected officials in our community, our job is to educate the, uh, especially the young people, in the use of drugs and uh, alcohol in the community. I don't smoke marijuana. I could be drug tested anytime anybody wants to. But the idea is for us to sit here and be a little, um, a little more I think we have to hold this, uh, this office a little more professionally, uh, knowing that you know, we're not here to, to build things, we're not here to construct buildings, so we're not here to build roads, we're here to advocate for the people that actually voted for us to be in the office. So I believe it's important for us to advocate and to push our, the, uh, the ideas forward, but as far as personal issues, I have never done it. Well, I, no, no, I, I don't do it. And I, and I don't have a problem getting uh, drug tested. Okay, next would be Gene. Mr. Foden, thank you so much for asking that question. I too got at the door whether or not I do smoke. I've never smoked, but I can tell you I do not have any issue with anybody who does. Uh, I've never do it, and I probably will never do, but I think it's important for us to talk about this issue. But tonight I'm here to talk about um, educations of our children, um, the ability to engage our young people, the homelessness situations, and so much more. So for the sake of your questions and in the spirit of all of it, I've never smoked. Although I'm the youngest person here, um, I do believe that we do have to talk about this drug issue. But I do believe people do have the freedoms, and if they're doing it according based on medical situations, um, I don't have the power to tell them what to do. But in my case, I never do. I probably will never do it. Thank you. Okay, next would be Bill Hogan. I'm probably one of the dullest people you'll ever meet. I don't smoke, I don't drink, I've never done drugs. Um, so this, the question's kind of comical for me. Um, I, I, was, I actually delivered uh, medication for about 30 years with Farm America Dunnington Drugs. I've handled more drugs than probably anybody alive. Um, but the, the, the medical uh, marijuana, I have no problem with it, but I am, I am strongly opposed to having uh, marijuana legalized. Um, it, one of the things that I do, uh, I'd like to bring up is, we do hold our bars and restaurants accountable for somebody that drinks and maybe gets in a car action accident and hurts somebody. Um, they could lose their license. Do we have any false safe um, policies in for the medical 
uh, dispensaries. The, they held to the same accountability as a bar would or a restaurant. Um, it's, well, it's a question. It's more of a question than a, uh, an answer. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Next would be Scott Hall. <coughs> I've smoked cannabis and I have inhaled. Um, uh, one of the things I'm wondering about uh, the whole cannabis controversy is why it's so demonized. I've talked to doctors that actually say it's an exit drug from opiates. Um, and the other thing that bothers me about demonizing cannabis, it's a plant, it's not really a drug, alcohol is a drug. I don't have time to get into all that, but uh, one of the things that we're doing by demonizing this is preventing further research into cures and treatments for cancer. And that's wrong. Um, that's all I have to say about it. And a drug test, I mean, uh, people are tricking drug tests on a daily basis, so there's no point in wasting money on a drug test. Thanks, take care. Thank you. Next would be Jacob. Steve, I've watched all the debates you've been a part of, and I was looking forward to this question. I think it's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, in terms of a city councilor, um, it's already, you know, this issue has already been decided at state level, so it's, it's legal. Um, I don't smoke. Um, if we're talking about wine testing, I love wine, Moscato, sweet wine. My good friend Donna would tell you, we, you know, I drink wine. Um, honestly, though, I have to say I am for all elected officials from the mayor on down, um, for drug testing, city councilors, um, and school committee members, and you know, holding if we're going to hold our departments to these standards, you know, I know it's been discussed the you know drug test. I, I want to say it was the police department, not on marijuana, but I think as leaders we need to set the example. I I would take a drug test right now today, Mr. Foot, if you had it, um, and be 100% comfortable with that. But I think we have to set the example. You know, if we're if I'm going to ask my employee to clean the bathroom, I need to clean the bathroom, lead by example. So, by all means, a great question, sir. I've been waiting for it. Thank you. Okay, and uh, last but not least on this question, Gary Key. Thank you for that question, Steve. Um, I'm 58 years old. In my late teens, in my early 20s, I experimented with uh, smoking marijuana. Okay, since I've been married and since I had children, I have not smoked. I, I never smoked a cigarette. I haven't smoked any, uh, he called it cannabis. We used to call it weed. Um, I do occasionally drink some wine and maybe an occasional beer. I'm not, I've never been a big drinker. Um, so no one can ever say they saw me drunk uh, in that capacity. But um, to say have I ever experimented with it in my late teens, in my uh, early 20s, yes I have, okay. Um, as far as taking a drug test, I could take one like Jacob just said, I could take one for anyone at any time. And I think as a city official, we should be held to a higher standard and I would have no problem if that were, if drug testing was mandatory for us to take. Thank you. Okay. We will go to round two of the questions and we will go back to Kevin Tachi. If it helps Mr. Foote's cause, I too will go take the test. So it'll, <laughs> I will follow the cause as well. Okay. Just, just, wanna, just, just, the just want to throw it out yes. there. So that's what I meant. I, all I, right. So I serve the people. All right. So we'll get back to the issues. And, and that is, what's your opinion of how the city streets are? Are they safer? than two years ago when we held a city election. This is kind of a two-part question, okay? If yes, why? If no, what needs to be done? And if you can find a way to kind of work your time, uh, does the city need more manpower? Does the, the police department need more manpower or a different approach to policing? Okay, we're gonna start with Moses. <clears throat> Statistically, our streets are safer. But as far as perception is concerned, our streets are not safer. There's gunfire on a regular basis in our community. Uh, it's been said here before. And the perception of crime sometimes makes our city street even less safe. Now, I believe that we are now at the point where we have the most police officers we've had in quite some time. But throwing police at the, at the public safety issue is not the answer. There's got to be a better way to do it in terms of a, a collaborative, collaborative effort between the community and the police. Because police, unless we all get one, 
to take home with us. We can't have a police officer for everybody. So it has to be more of a collaboration between the community and the police and law enforcement in, in itself to make our streets even safer. But statistically, our city is safer. Thank you. Okay, next would be Jacob. So can you repeat the question? This is in terms yeah, of the public safety. The question is, is, in your opinion, are the city streets safer than they were two years ago? Because we had an election every two years. Mm -hmm. If yes, why? If no, what needs to be done to make them safer? And if you could find a way to weave it into your answer, uh, does the city need more manpower or a different approach to policing? So the first part of the question, I want to reiterate what um, Councilor at Large Farwell had said earlier, um, shootings, whether where people are you know being actually shot or it's just a shooting, no, it hasn't gotten safer in my opinion. Statistically, yes. Have we had as many murders than we, as we had two years ago? No, but we've had a hell of a lot of shootings in this city. One of my um, good friends and campaign members just the other night um, at her house, uh, when she was, you know, babysitting the grandkids, there was a shooting at 2 a.m. in the morning. Another a friend of, of mine had a, you know, the, they're not involved in this. So to answer that question, no, it's the streets aren't safer. Um, and also, you know, in the private sector, I do, you know, understand what Council um, Rodriguez was saying um, about you can't throw police at the issue. Community policing is a, a big thing. I also think we do need to um, cut down on overtime and hire more police officers. Um, again, you have to you know, make sure you tie in the community policing aspect, but hire more police officers, make sure they're safe. Um, but no, the, the streets aren't safer in my opinion, no. Thank you. Okay, next would be Gene. Thought you got all the excellent question. Um, how do I put this? Actually, uh, did a lot of research about the situation in Brockton. And of course, uh, according to the gentleman who spoke before, the other one said, I believe the city is um, safer than it used to be. Um, two years ago, how do I put this? According to the um, FBI um, database, it seems like the number has gone down, but the perceptions of certain folks has not changed, not just within the city, even outside of Brockton. But here's what I can tell you. When it's come down to uh, policing, I'm not um, a cop, but I did study law enforcement. I think we need to build trust, not just within the police department, but also the public. What happened is that there's a saying, if you see something, say something, we gotta be able to say so. And when we say something, we know that somebody will act upon it. But the perception of knowing that the city is bad, it's pretty warm. We have an excellent um, police department, and I love the city, but I think we as Brocktonian, we have an obligation not just to talk about Brockton, but to uh, come together and focus on what's going on. And I think Brockton is great, and I thank the police department for what they are doing, but I do believe there is room for improvement, and that's where I'm wanting for city council at large. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Sullivan. So I think if you look at the stats on certain crimes, there's definitely been a decrease over two years. But at the end of the day, what, what really is the catalyst for crime, uh, not just in the city of Brockton, but in the Commonwealth and nationwide, it's, it's the drugs, legal and illegal. There's, there's right now a tsunami called the opiate addiction, uh, and, and it needs to be addressed. I mean, here in the city of Brockton, we're having massive overdoses. We had the DA before us the other night. Uh, we have state police here now. We have that beautiful DA's office downtown. Uh, we have the feds here as well, and we have a great Brockton police force. The men and women put their you know, lives on the line. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we have to have a collaborative approach. We have to work with the parents, we have to work with the schools, and we have to work with law enforcement to address it. But the drugs really is the linchpin to crime here in the city of Brockton and the perception as such. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next would be Councilor Farrow. Uh, I too agree that we are not safer. I think there are, again, far too many shootings. I think that calls for a different approach to policing. Uh, number one, I think we need to go back to an expanded neighborhood crime watch program like we had in the 1990s. There are seven wards in the city. I would like to see citizens in each of those seven wards step up and perhaps be crime watch coordinators. We could record information, pass it on to the police. Most people now have an iPhone or something that could record a suspicious vehicle or activity even from their home window, mm -hmm. pass it on to the police. Um, definitely hire more people and less dependency on overtime. It's very expensive to put an officer on the street a time and a half, but if you hire more officers, they're going to come in at entry level wages. So you'll get a little bit more, as they say, bang for the buck. And if you start to do that, I think you will see crime, uh, shall we say, reduced, not eliminated. And, uh, any other solution I don't think is going to have the same impact. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next would be Gary Keith. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, I believe that our streets are a little bit safer than the last two years. Um, statistically, it says that, but when I say that, just like everyone else, I agree that we do have the shootings and things like that. I believe they are, most of them are drug related. Just about a month ago, I actually uh, had to revive someone from overdosing myself that was actually dead, and no one there knew how to actually give CPR. So I stepped in and I actually revived that person um, before the paramedics got there. Um, the crime that we have here in Brockton right now, it's all, it's, most of it is drug related, and it's, all, and it's a pocket full of crime. Back in the 90s when I first moved to, to Brockton, the streets were, were from one side to the other, was prostitution, um, drugs was straight out there in the front. Everything has been pushed to the back. Now, as far as our police go, they do an excellent job. I think they're understaffed still, but, um, and they do need more help. But right now, I think they're doing an excellent job, and um, you know, hopefully we can get them the help that they need to help combat what's out there now. Thank you. Okay, Scott Hall. I forgot to mention this in the last question. Kind of relates to this question, by the way. Um, I'm not under the influence of cannabis, if anybody's wondering right now. Um, as far as that goes, too, just think about all the resources that was squandered over the past decade to uh, fighting and demonizing people using a plant that's now legal. Now we don't have to use any of those resources. As far as community policing goes, I'm not really sure what that quite means. Um, I don't see too many police officers walking around the communities that are plagued by crime. And for, furthermore, stats can be, me being an expert on data and stats, stats can be very misleading. A lot of the crime isn't being reported. So, you know, think about that when we talk about the crime rate being lowered. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Bill Hogan. Great question, Kevin. I, I love this one. Uh, as a former shop owner downtown, uh, we, we kind of got ready, um, used to seeing the beat police downtown. And there's, like, there's kind of like a network downtown where if, when the, the people um, see th the beat police, it gets all over downtown within 10 minutes. And it's up to Perkins Park and it's down to Belmont Street. Um, Mr. Farwell touched on this twice already tonight, where we need more police. We need more boots on the streets. Uh, we need the beat police to be policy, not overtime. We need them here on right on Main Street, right on downtown. It's a basic fundamental of actually having a downtown. I grew up with the beat police on downtown. Also, if we hire more police, I would give um, the Brockton police officers more details. Right now, we don't have enough Brockton policemen to man, or, uh, man Brockton details. We have people from the Sheriff's Department, which is fine, and outside of downtown. But they're not Brockton police people. We need Brockton police people there that know where Court Street is and Main Street is, and they can radio, and then, um, they can help their other offices. They know the logistics of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question, Shana Barnes. Thank you. Um, this has been a, a, an issue that's gone on, uh, as um, Mr. Tachi said, you know, his was about the safety, public safety and crime. This is also something that the constituents and that the residents, and I'm sure you all are uh, very passionate about. What would you do specifically to encourage more businesses to come to the city of Brockton? And I also do not mean, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess maybe absent the proposal for the urban renewal plan and, and the downtown area, not just focusing on the downtown, because as you know, we have pretty much you know store deserts and uh, economic depression outside on the outskirts of the city as well. So uh, what would you do specifically to encourage new and prosperous, sustainable business uh, into the city? First up, uh, Councilor Farrell. I think the very first priority has to be to change the perception that Brockton is an unsafe city. Most unfortunately, people from outside the city feel as though that they can't come into the city because again they read about the shootings that occur. They read about shot spotter going off or they read about arrests that are made for 
people drinking alcoholic beverages downtown and annoying people. Unless we address the perception that many people have about Brockton being an unsafe city, I do not believe we're going to be successful attracting new businesses to come in. What's the solution? Again, I go back to the police department. Walking beats, visibility, having the officers get out of their cruiser and interact with business owners and residents to talk about what's going on, what information do you have for us, what can you help us, how can you help us solve a particular incident that may have just occurred. So that relationship with the police and that perception has got to change or we're not going to enjoy the economic development that we, we deserve. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Gene. Next. And again, Council, thank you so much for that question. Um, when was it? Last Saturday, I was actually knocking on doors um, in Ward 4. I was talking to a wonderful um, woman, and she was like, um, where do you live? And I said, I live in Ward 1. And she said, are you not scared? And I'm like, scared of what? She said, scared of Brock. And I said, no. Um, the more I was talking to her, I realized that we do have people in this city who are scared of coming downtown Brock. And I think that's a problem. And I do believe it's a lack of communication because even some of the folks that we have live in the city sometimes come up with that bad perception. And I think we got to be able to build that communication skill and hopefully pass it around and let our resident know that this is a good place to be. But in terms of business, I think we should change the ideology that we've been using for so many years in terms of like welcoming business downtown. Let's face it, we are the only city in the entire um, Plymouth County that has three train stops. What can we do to encourage developers to come and build stuff around there? In order for you to do this, you know what you got to do? You have to build choice. Public safety is an issue, and education, that's the best way to target it. And that's what I will do, and that's what I hope to do. Okay, next would be Scott Hall. We definitely need to appeal to businesses. One of the things that seems to scare away businesses are the, uh, well, the, what people have talked about, the crime rate, also the tax rate, the water rates, especially for businesses that use water to, you know, further their business. They can't afford these sudden increases, you know, to their budgets. Um, we should also look into this Amazon thing that's getting buzzed nationwide. I think Brockton's ideal for a uh, facilitating the needs of Amazon and the 50,000 jobs they're looking to bring to a community. Um, we have so much affordable warehouse space in the city, throughout the city. Maybe we should definitely look into uh, creating an industrial park somewhere in the city too. And uh, yeah, let's talk about the good stuff about Brockton, like how beautiful DW Fields Park is and all of that stuff. Let's talk about the good stuff in Brockton. That that also might appeal to businesses. Thank you. Okay, and next Moses. I, I do agree that the issue of crime, uh, and I said it I guess two years ago, that the crime and the perception of crime keeps holding Brockton down. But I, I also want us to think about this. Boston, the city of Boston is by far more violent than Brockton is. And yet businesses are knocking down the doors of Boston to start businesses in Boston. I think one of the things that we need to do, we need to start thinking outside the box. We cannot just focus on having these little meetings in the chamber and having talks with our friends, but we have to seriously step outside of Brockton to bring businesses from outside of Brockton into Brockton. Because I think we've gone as far as we can go with local Brockton business, we need to step up. Why can't we get in Bo with Boston and ask GE to put a small little percentage of what they put in Boston in Brockton? I think we have to think outside the box because if we don't do it, no one else is gonna do it for us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bill Hogan. <coughs> As far as businesses go, um, just for the, uh, the basic uh, fundamentals, um, Brockton's been situated, it's, there's, a, it's been a, there's such a thing as logistics and infrastructure that would just take care of things and, and attract people. Uh, everybody's aware of the tax rates, nobody wants to pay any more taxes, so that's the easy way out. But what Brockton's been doing for the last 50 years ago, uh, so is we've been trying to develop the city east-west and we've been trying to develop the outside of the, uh, of the town. Um, Brockton is laid out uh, as a north-south town. The railroad runs north-south, the highways run north-south. 
Um, we're, we're, we're south of Boston, north of Providence and the Cape. So we're very well uh, situated logistically, yet we concentrate on developing east-west, and it's, a, it's just fundamentally uh, flawed. Again, the, the north-south is the Campello, Montello, and the downtown area. Um, and, and sometimes logistics and infrastructure can help problems. I'm not saying they cure everything. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next would be Councilor Sullivan. Council Bonds, as you know, I think the number one asset here in the city of Brockton are, are the people, the residents. I mean, if, if Brockton was a stock, we'd all buy it. Um, but I think we have some mechanisms that we can use, like uh, TIFs, tax incremental financing. Um, we need to make sure the businesses that are here don't leave here, like when Sorelli Foods left here. But we also want to attract businesses. Keneally Foods came here uh, from Boston. Bernardi Auto came here from Boston because of TIFs. W.B. Mason was going to leave. We gave them a TIF so that they would stay here. Um, I think downtown Brockton will, will never, ever be like 1950s when my parents met at the Center Theater and my grandmother was running Fannie Farmers. But we need to look see, to see what the expansion can be out throughout the whole city, um, Westgate Mall and the like. But I think at the end of the day, um, we need to work collaboratively. We need to work with the health care facilities. We have three hospitals here with the VA, Brockton, and Good Sam. So we need to leverage these things. Um, and as legislators, as city councils, we can do that, working with other elected officials to make sure that we have the growth that's going to help the tax base. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, and next, Jacob Tanner. I know your, your question, you said not uh, focus on just solely downtown, mm -hmm. but I think an issue um, we haven't touched on yet is the, the, the perception and that reality of downtown. So, and I, I know Mr. Lindy and, and his great staff that work in this building and you guys as well, when I drive, you know, to this building, we have people sleeping on the steps outside. So when people say perception, it's reality. The reality of, of, of our city right now is we have a, 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 some serious challenges when it comes to our homeless population. We um, definitely need to look into uh, trying to help these individuals get back on their feet. Because um, again, it's, it's not perception, it's reality. We have a serious homeless issue. Um, we have other challenges that we need to address. Um, downtown, I do agree with Mr. Hogan. I think it, it should be a focus. Um, I love the signs. Uh, but you can just walk out the door right now and you can see the, the, one of the biggest challenges to keep in, you know, business from wanting to come here. Uh, and I do also agree with um, what Councilor Sullivan said is we have to look at tax incentives for businesses, but we have to deal with these issues before we can do that, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, and last but not least on this one, Derek Keith. Thank you. I love this question, the reason being is that I agree that we need to change the, uh, our safety here in our public safety here in the city. However, I agree with uh, what Councilor Sullivan said as far as the tips go for other businesses because of the fact that we actually, we're not a destination stop, okay? Our mall is not a destination point. Okay, people go to South Shore Mall. Okay, that's their destination stop. We do not have a destination stop in this city. Um, we don't have a five-star restaurant. We have no reason for anyone to come here. So at this point here, I think is uh, we need to do our due diligence as counselors, as ambassadors of the city of Brockton, use any resources we have with the tips and everything else and basically go out, sit down with businesses and convince them, negotiate with them until we can make them see that it's to their advantage to come to Brockton and do business. Thank you. Okay. What do, uh, you can, I, I, you can, I can do 30 seconds, and anybody that wants it, sure. Um, one thing I want to make sure I keep consistent in, in this forum is the, it's the administration's job to uh, run the day-to-day -day and you know, recruit businesses. You know, hopefully when I'm elected to sit on the council, we advocate for it, but again, council needs to write legislation, make sure we appropriate, making sure the, the budget's approved and appropriated. Um, and again, just, we have to hold people accountable. So while that question is a good question, it is, and we need to work together to, to recruit businesses, that is not the city council's job. Thank you. Does anybody else want to address that in a rebuttal? No, sorry. Okay, we're gonna go right to uh, Steve Foote with uh, his next question. Uh, State Representative Tom Calter has accused Brockton of causing an algae problem in the ponds in his area due to uh, Brockton's overuse of water at Silver Lake. 
Uh, do you support Mayor Carpenter's proposal to buy the Aquaria plant to solve this problem? Let's start with Gary Keith. Thank you for that question. Um, after we do all our due diligence of looking at every other option that we might have, I would agree with buying um, Aquaria, but not at the price that, uh, that's being negotiated right now. We do need, as everyone knows, we are, regular, um, we are mandated to have a secondary water source, and, um, but we need to do better than what we're, we have right now. Um, we're paying a lot of money for water that we don't use, and I think that $78 million is just a little bit too much. So I would back that plan if the price of it was more reasonable. Thank you. Thank you. Next would be uh, Council Rodriguez. I, I, imagine buying a house and you have no idea what the house is worth. Right now, Aquaria is asking $78 million out of the taxpayers in this community, and we have absolutely no idea how much that plant's worth. I am for owning as many resources as we possibly can. But at $78 million, that plant's not worth $78 million. That plant is not even worth half of $78 million. If they come back with something that makes sense, something that's doable, then we'll talk. But at $78 million, I'm not prepared to, sad, uh, to saddle the city of Brockton and the taxpayers with $78 million worth of a plant that, um, that most people think that's not even worth half of the cost. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Sullivan. <coughs> well, I've been an, uh, an outspoken uh, opponent to this. $78 million, it doesn't make business sense or common sense. At the end of the day, uh, since it's been operational, it's had one customer in all those years, the city of Brock, and no other municipality uh, abutting is interested in it. If you purchased it, first of all, 78 is way out of whack when you look at the true value. But when you purchase it, you own the good and the bad. You're going to have to pay for the salaries of the people that are running it, uh, all the repairs, all the upkeep, it goes all the way down to a sonnet. Um, we're in the people business as elected officials. We're not in the water business. Um, Council Fowler and I filed a resolve to talk to the MWRA to see if that might make sense. Uh, but at the uh, dollar amount that the mayor, the current mayor, is proposing, it's ludicrous, and it just doesn't make sense, and I do not support it in its current content. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Farwell. Steve, I don't favor purchasing the plant either for several different reasons. Uh, Number one, desalin desalination is a process that consumes a lot of energy, electricity. If electric rates go up and they're forecast to go up by about 30 percent in the coming years, that's going to be very expensive for the city if we own the plant. Number two, we would take on all of the liability for 16 miles of pipeline from Dighton to Brockton. If anything happened within that pipeline and a road was undermined or someone's property was damaged, then the city would be on the hook for repairing that. Number three, I don't know what the labor costs would be. So I'm not going to gamble with that amount of money and have the taxpayers on the hook for owning a plant when we don't even know if it'll work to capacity. It's supposedly a 10 million gallon per day plant. It's never pumped more than 4 million gallons per day in its lifetime. So it's like buying a car. They tell you it'll go 60 miles an hour but you've never driven it at over 30 and you don't know if it'll go any faster. So count me out, I'm not for this particular purchase. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Scott Hall. So we've talked about transparency uh, earlier. Um, there's a lot of unknowns with this desalination plant, uh, especially the, if, if we're to purchase this, we need full disclosure as far as who were the initial investors and what they invested and what they stand to gain from this. Um, also, we need an independent inspection of the facility, you know. Like Mo Moses said, um, we can't just, you know, buy something without knowing what it's worth. My understanding is that we, um, per tide, uh, it's either low or high tide, uh, we take two and a half million gallons out of the Taunton River. Um, that's five million gallons a day right now that it can handle. We use nine to 11 million per gallons of water every day in Brockton. And right now the desalination plant is using two million gallons per day at a rate a lot higher than Silver Lake. 
Okay, Bill Hogan. Steve, was that Councilman from Abington or uh, uh, Lakeville? The Councilman that would brought up the uh, state rep. He's from Abington. Okay. Um, the, I'm against the buying the the, um, the plant. And, and Mr. Fowl, everybody's touched on this. I don't think you're going to get anybody that really uh, doesn't understand this. When you buy something, um, you own it. You don't even have a janitor. You don't have anybody that can clean the bathrooms. You don't have, you have an electric bill. You have a heating bill. Uh, it's $78 million to buy, to buy the building. I'm assuming we're going to be paying taxes to the city of Dighton, uh, the town of Dighton. Is that where the, the plant is situated? Um, there is all kinds of hidden costs to buying uh, $78 million. Um, as far as the, uh, the Silver Lake, uh, we have great neighbors over that way, Abington, Hanover, Lakeville, and all that other place. Um, but what I think those towns have to understand is Brockton has the hospitals. We have the infrastructure that they actually need. We have to continue to be good neighbors. People in Brockton need to drink water. We need the Silver Lake in, we need the, we need the water. That's a basic, basic line. I think what they're also concerned about though, is, is Montponset Pond some of the area ponds that they draw down on to keep Silver Lake at a, at a different level. So we need to look at another, another source, but we definitely need Silver Lake. Thank you. Thank you. Jacob Decker. You guys are asking some great questions, but these ones are easy for me. I am 100% a no on purchasing Aquaria. Something I want to touch on um, that our current council has mentioned is the cost. To purchase is $78 million, but as you guys know, we would have to pay interest on that. So we would be asking uh, for the life of the, the um, loan or bond, looking to pay $101 million. And we all can agree, I would, I would think, this is a bad deal from the get-go. When, when you, you know, are on this council, you got a bad deal um, from the get-go. I don't believe anything I've seen with Aquaria that they've shown me that it's even a business I would really want to deal with. I even would want to take it a step further and try to challenge the breaches in the contract. And I applaud the current council for you know, withholding you know, payments at, at a point to try to challenge Aquaria, but I, I honestly on the council would look to challenge the breaches in the contract. Um, but I'm a definite no, that's not gonna change for me from what they've presented, so no. Thank you. Okay, I got a, about a 20. Gene Bradley. Gene Bradley. I'm sorry that you okay. are, there we go. So I'm the youngest and I think that might be the reason why you do. <laughs> no, I skipped over you. I was looking at the wrong number. Anyway, uh, sorry. when it's come down to the city of Brockton, and of course as a candidate, I think my job is to represent everybody in Brockton. And of course, not just representing them, but making sure that the decision that we are making, you know, is the best. Here's what I can tell you. So, uh, so far, fortunately, I've been able to talk to you know, some of the experts when it's come down to what to do some research about what's going on. And according to them, you know, we probably have some pipe issue. And um, I don't really know too much about the water, but according to what they said, we are looking into it. So as I'm doing the research to determine whether or not, um, you know, we can actually purchase this, here's what I can tell you. I think we can still debating the price. So as of right now, I'm researching the situation to find out what's going on, but I do believe that our city need a lot of resources. And of course, the Silver Lake situation, this is something that I know for my job. But I do believe the city of Brockton deserve better, and my job is to make sure that we are doing all we can to protect them. So according to my research, based on the result that we find, when that decision comes, I'll be more glad to make a final one. Thank you. Okay, so we're in the about the 20 minute range, and I need about 16 minutes for closing statements. So uh, someone here has a particular specialty. It's called a lightning round. I, I think it's copyrighted or something. So I'm going to let Kevin Tachi ask the last question, and uh, um, I'm going to let Kevin pick the order this time. How's that? Really? Yep. Okay. I can do that. Let's uh, let's go with. We'll start with. Affordable housing. Does Brockton have a developing issue when it comes to affordable housing? Start with Mr. Farwell. And it's a yes or no it's for a yes or 30 no. seconds. Yes or no, and if he wants to give a sentence or two, but it has to be yeah. quick. Yes, if we have an over-reliance on affordable housing and we don't look into the fact that we need to bring in business and industry that will create jobs. Okay. okay. Mr. Taggart. Of course, you know, I'm going to ask you, can you further clarify yeah. the question? Does, does Brockton have a developing issue when it comes to affordable housing? I think yes or no, and you can give me one or two sentences to back up your yes or no. 
think we have enough affordable housing. I'm not saying, um, you know, we have enough affordable housing, in my opinion. Okay. okay. Mr. Okay. Hall. Uh, the question's sort of vague. I would, I would tend to agree with Jacob Tagger on that one. Uh, we have a lot of affordable housing in Brockton as it is. Okay. We really need to audit the Federal Reserve because they're manipulating the housing market. Okay. And that needs to be addressed. Again, the reason why I'm asking, because I know that Thatcher Street is one of those, what, it's one of those things right now is a current issue, and it's been, I've heard residents and seen things posted in regards to it. So, uh, Nick, first up, Mr. Hogan. I didn't have enough time to do all my notes here, but um, we, I think we do have a, ha a problem with the uh, affordable housing here in Brockton. And my take is that the, uh, we, what we do is we actually just take the easy way out when we look for developers, we have all these major developments coming to Brockton and they're either subsidized by the government or they're affordable housing. Okay. Um, I don't have a problem with the housing, just that I think our planning is taking the easy way out. Right, that's why it's a lightning round question. Yes One or, or no. two sentences, it's gotta be quick. That was okay. too many then, I'm no, sorry. Okay. No. <laughs> Keep. Jean, and, and conferring with one of, my counsel, one of my counterparts here, emerging, instead of developing an emerging problem with uh, affordable housing, is that right? Yeah, Jean Bradley, uh, that's the name. Yes, uh, how do I put this? You know, th it's a very complex question. I'm going to tell you why. You got low income housing. Wait, wait. You got low income housing. You got affordable housing, and you got market rate housing. This is one of the things that I've seen a lot of mm -hmm. people have been confused. Lightning round. In terms of low income housing, I think we have enough. In terms of affordable housing, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Keith. Do we have an emerging problem when it comes to affordable housing? Um, I think we do. We do. Because I think that we're being a little bit confused with uh, affordable housing and market rate rent right now. And I think people are looking at it as being the same thing, and it's not. Because uh, One or two sentences. Yes, because my, um, low affordable housing basically comes with some subsidies sometimes, and I think we're losing that. Uh, and say, thank you. Mr. Rodriguez. Yes, we do, but... At the same time, I think the definition of affordable needs to be redefined because affordable doesn't mean free. Okay. Mr. Sullivan. I, I don't think we do have a problem. Um, An there is a, problem. There is, a, there is a difference between workforce housing and affordable housing. When you look at the Brockton Housing Authority, nationally recognized, that's affordable housing. That's Section 8. But workforce is what development's trying to happen right now in Brockton. That's good for a tax base, Kevin. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we are at the point uh, for closing statements and uh, the order was drawn to begin with. We are going to start with Moses Rodriguez. Well, at least uh, I'm going first this time. Um, well, Mark, thank you very much for having us and the panelists. Uh, thank you very much for being here and BCA and the folks at home. Thank you for uh, uh, putting up with us for the last uh, hour and a half or so. I've been in the council now for three plus years and it's been a pleasure. I hope to go back and continue to advocate for you. As I said before, our job is not to build things. Our job is to advocate for you, the taxpayers of this community. Uh, it doesn't really matter how you got here. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican. What matters is that we are living in this little boat called Brockton. And I think it's time that we all start rowing together for the sake of Brockton. We say a lot of things about you know, the immigrants. We say a lot of things about uh, native-born Americans, but you know what? It doesn't really matter how we got here. It doesn't really matter who we are. As long as we want to call Brockton home and we want to work together to make, make Brockton better. Brockton is a great city. It has some great potential. It could do a lot better. We can hold people accountable. We can ask the people who are paid to do the jobs that they're being paid to do to do it better. Uh, with that, I believe that Brockton could become even a greater city. For that, I count on you to vote and send me back to the City Council on November 7th. I'm second on the ballot, and I appreciate the fact that you've given me the privilege of serving you for three plus years, so please also continue to support me and give me two more years. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Uh, next would be Jacob Tagger. Thank you to BCA and our um, our hosts and moderators today. Um, thank you to the residents and voters of Brockton um, for allowing us to take this time to be able to explain and um, distinguish ourselves as 
the, the four best candidates to represent Brockton in the next two years. As I stated in my opening statement, um, I'm a lifelong resident of Brockton, where I live here with my wife and two kids. Uh, I've been an activist and a volunteer, dedicated volunteer in the city of Brockton for 23 years of those, um, 41 years in my life. Um, this election, so, you know, last election I was involved in a, in a mayoral campaign. Um, in the, the, mayor, the mayor's race always gets all the attention, but Brockton is a strong council, weak mayor. And that's no disrespect to the mayor, but it's just the way things are. The, the, the council is the accountability. This election, voters need to pick the four council at large candidates who are truly independent candidates, who are not being pushed by certain groups to um, push certain agendas. Um, and again, I 100% believe that when I am elected um, to, to be one of your next council at larges alongside um, Councilor Farwell, uh, Sullivan, and um, Rodriguez, that I will continue to be an advocate for the residents and business owners in the city of Brockton and hold um, you know, those that need to be held accountable accountable. And that's what this election is about making sure that we maintain accountability, transparency, and, and true advocates for the residents and business owners in the city of Brockton. On November 7th, I need you to look for my name, Jacob L. Taggart Jr., number eight on the ballot on November 7th. My voice is your voice. Thank you very much. Next, Councilor Sullivan. First of all, I want to thank each and every one of you, and I want to thank the people running for office. It really is a daunting task, and great time away from your family. My name is Robert Sullivan, and I want to continue to serve as a counselor at large representing the entire city of Brockton. I want to continue to be your voice, your advocate, working with you, working for you. Uh, my campaign uh, has been endorsed by the Brockton Police Patrolmen's Association, and the Brockton Firefighters, SEIU Mass Council. I only mention that because uh, it's an honor and a privilege to serve, and they respect what I've done. It's about proven leadership. Not how long you've been elected but what you've done while you've been there. And I, I, you know, I say at the end of the day, Brockton's my home, it's your home. I want to make sure that we have a safe home. And in order to do that, you have to have the right people at City Hall working for you because you're the taxpayers, you're the constituents, and you're the residents that I proudly serve. So I am asking for you, first of all, to go vote. Do your civic duty. It doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, unenrolled, independent. Any registered voter can go to the polls on Tuesday, November 7th. My name is Robert Sullivan, Councilor at Large, current City Council President, and I'm asking you respectfully, humbly, and I'm asking for your vote on that day. I'm number three on the ballot, and I want to continue to serve to represent all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, next would be Scott Hall. So I meant to say a full audit of the Federal Reserve, not just an audit. They've already done audits of the Federal Reserve, but not complete ones. Um, I want to go into this a little more and segue, just bear with me. Um, the, the Federal Reserve, you know, basically knows when the price of gas goes up, you know, who's going to be going to the bars, what jobs are going to be gained, what jobs are going to be lost. It also knows, you know, what's going to happen when it hikes the interest rate or lowers the interest rate. And it's totally repugnant to a, fl a free market. We need to go back to a gold, silver, and natural resource standard um, if we're going to have a free market. A lot of our problems are because we're not getting support from the federal and the state levels. That being said, the, I don't see us solving the problem of infrastructure unless we get a lot more federal funding. Um, we need to call our, our representatives at the federal level and implore them to fund Brockton, just keep calling, saying, hey, we need funding, you know, please fund us. One street or two per ward per year is, is going to be a long time before we fix the roads. Um, also, the, uh, the problem with homelessness is uh, a serious one. And it, it, we shouldn't approach it as like, you know, these are human beings suffering. We need to look at that when we start talking about homelessness and how we're going to solve the problem. Um, it has a lot to do with the housing market. 
It has a lot to do with the pharmaceutical cartels. Um, we really need to do a lot. And uh, if we're going to fix roads and sidewalks too, maybe we should look into fundraising. Thanks for your time and take care. Okay, uh, Gene Bradley. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Mike Lindy, BCA, and of course the panelists. And I would like to thank each and every single one of you for taking the time to put your name on the ballot because I know it's a lot. And of course, I would like to thank you, the residents of Brockton. My name is Gene Bradley, the Renan Court, or the guy with the longest name. I'm number four on the ballot. I was born in Haiti. I came here six years and nine months ago. When I came, I could not speak a word of English. Fortunately, I was able to go to the Wacken Public Library, where I learned English and then went to Massasoit, graduated with a double major, and then went to Suffolk University, graduated with my bachelor. As we speak, I'm doing a master there. But I will never forget my first job in this city was at Crystal's Restaurant. We have learned the greatness of Brockton and the people of Brockton that built the foundation for me to be here. Tonight, I'm not here to tell you my story, but I'm here to listen to your voice. My job is to talk to you and listen to you and to hear what you have to say about the great city of us. Since February 11th, we've been campaigning, knocking at your doors, leaving notes for you, talking to you, talk about the issues. We come up with the platforms because we believe that what you said was true. Youth empowerment, education, public safety, homelessness, and of course, our seniors. Based on what you told me, I sat down with my team. We come up with the best platform to represent you. I am happy to be the youngest person running for city council at large, but I'm also happy to be able to speak five different languages because of the diversity of our city. It is important to us to know that our city is great because of all of us, and I could not be more proud to be a Brocktonian. What makes me so happy is because through Brockton, I become a US citizen because of the greatness of those people. And as we speak, I'm one of the library trustees and also one of the YMCA trustees. So it's important for me to tell that story outside of Brockton because in this city, we have greatness, we have people who have the ability to inspire and move on. Thank you so much for opening the door for me and thank you so much for what you do. On November 7th, I hope I can count on your vote as the number four on the ballot. Again, the name is Jane Bradley, the Renan Court, or the guy with the longest name. Thank you so much. Believe in Brockton, and God bless you all. Okay, next would be Bill Hogan. Well, thank you, community, uh, Brockton Community Access, and Mark. And I thought Mark, Shane, and Steve, you had some very nice questions, very good questions thought out. Uh, I'd like to thank Jake for going out of his way to try to find me yesterday and invite me. I'm not the easiest person to find, other than I am always downtown working for Brockton. But I don't have a phone. I don't like phones. <laughs> but thank you guys for inviting me. Um, but I'd like to thank the taxpayers and the citizens of Brockton, too, because, um, again, I'm a Brockton historian. Everything that's been thrown at Brockton for, during my lifetime, and we still function at a pretty high uh, uh, capacity, and uh, it's the city of champions. And I go to a lot of meets, and everybody gets okayed, and everybody's thanking everybody, and they're all pack packing their backs. Well, I'm going to have a policy. If every time we do something, I'm going to say, Thank you, taxpayers. Thank you, citizens of Brockton. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm very comfortable with my seven opponents here, political. Um, I think we have um, a great choices. I, the, the four, whoever's lucky enough to be the four counselor at large, um, good luck. Um, I'm very comfortable with having you there. And thank you. Good night. Thank you, Bill. Um, next is Gary Key. <coughs> Again, I'd like to thank you, Mark and BCA, and our three panelists. Um, but most of all, I'd like to thank you, our citizens, who uh, invited us into their, their homes tonight. And uh, by the virtue of you casting your votes, we'll elect or re-elect the next four counts, uh, councils at large. My name is Gary Keefe Sr., and I, am, and I want to serve and represent you as one of your four counselors. I have gained the experience by being a husband of 31 years, a father to seven, a grandfather to four, and a foster parent to many more that are still a part of my family today. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I have an uh, extensive background in law enforcement. I'm a former business, business owner, and I currently serve you as a member of your planning board and your zoning board of appeals for the past four years. Um, I have the passion and the desire to serve you in our city by continuing to be accessible and transparent in all matters. Now is not the time to turn the leadership of our city over to inexperienced candidates. All you have to do is look at our federal government in Washington to see the results of inexperienced leadership. And that is not an endorsement to our incumbents because they have held the position. They need to earn their seat also. My name is Gary Keefe Sr. and I'm asking you for one of your votes for Councilor at Large 
My name is the seventh name on the ballot, and I'm asking you for your vote because experience matters. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And last word is uh, Councilor Winter Farrow. If you're watching this at home tonight, that means you have a profound interest in the future of Brockton. And you have an interest in the people who are going to represent you for the next two years. I've been blessed to represent you as a mayor, as a member of the school committee, and now as a counselor at large. And I humbly ask for your support on November 7th so that I can continue that service. And there's two things I'll promise to you. I'm not going to promise to you that I'll always vote the way you want me to because there are people who have differing opinions about different issues. But I will tell you that I will give you independence. I will always look at each issue that's brought before the council and I will ask myself, is it good for Brockton? Will it enhance the quality of life for our residents? Is it feasible? In the long term, will it be beneficial? The second thing I promise you is I will give you integrity. I have no hidden agendas. I have no backroom deals. I have no desire to be part of any particular group. I will treat everyone with courtesy and respect, and I will try to represent you to the best of my ability, weighing all of the issues that are brought before us. It's been an honor to serve with Councillor Rodriguez and Councillor Sullivan, and I might add Councillor Barnes during the last two years. I think we have exhibited great independence. I think we've been willing to step forward and when necessary hold the mayor and others accountable for actions within the city. And only if we have open, honest government is Brockton going to survive. You can take all of the issues and you can put them all into a hat, but if we don't all conduct ourselves with integrity and if we don't all maintain our independence and evaluate those issues and do what's best, then Brockton is not going to move forward. So again, I thank you. I'm Councillor at Large Winthrop Farwell. Please call me Wynn. It's been a great honor to represent you for the last two years. Thank you, Councillor. And uh, we are at the end of uh, this evening's debate. I want to thank my panel, Kevin Tocci, Councilor Barnes, and Steve Foote. I want to thank all the candidates for taking the time out to serve, run, take time away from your families, and bring the issues to the voters. I think it's important. We, we're the only place you're going to see everybody in one room, and we're very proud of that. We cover the council on a regular basis, the finance committee, the school committee, and we just want to make sure that everybody in this community knows how serious it is to go out and vote. 9.5 percent in the primary was not good. We want to quadruple that and, and you know, it'd be nice if it were 90 and not 9. So you're going to watch uh, this on Brockton Community Access. We'll be bringing you upcoming mayoral debates, um, city council and school committee debates, and then election coverage on November 7th. So thank you all for being here, and thank you to my staff and crew and panelists, and I wish you a good night.